Okay, so we'll be starting now, so please everyone take your seats. So in the next 30 minutes or so, Joe will tell us about syntax trees and Python, so make a big cheer for him. Hi, thanks everybody for attending. So today we're gonna to talk about syntax trees and Python, and specifically around automated code transformations. Um, first, a little introduction about myself. I am an SRE at Pinterest on the API team. I've been there for, I think, be four years this summer. Um, and Pinterest, and Pinterest mission in, is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. Uh, who here has actually heard of Pinterest? Okay, that's good. Who here has not heard of us? Okay, for you over there, um, the inspiration I get from Pinterest is dogs. Uh, there's many other things on Pinterest, but it's useful for lots of things, and so I think pugs are adorable, and so I have lots of pugs. Um, a little bit about pin, uh, Python at Pinterest. We use Python to serve over 250 million monthly active users in every single request to Pinterest, whether it's on mobile or desktop in Europe or the US or anywhere. Uh, it goes through uh, um, uh, Python, and it's been, been that way since day one. We actually started as a big Django app, and ever since then we've been using Python. Uh, we have over 2.6 million lines of Python code, along with 600,000 lines of comments. Um, so our code base is not small, and so a lot of the challenges we have that are very simple and small code base are exceedingly difficult when you have 2.6 million lines of code. Uh, for a bit of a data point, um, C Python itself is about a million lines of code, roughly, and so we are quite a bit bigger, and so we have quite a few problems as well. Um, so the problem that we were actually uh, dealing with is this is a talk I actually gave yesterday with my coworker Jordan Adler, um, which is reporting our giant code base, 2.6 million lines of it, from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, and it turns out refactoring at this scale is really, really painful if you don't have any sort of automated ways to do it. Um, and so there are a few things you want to do. We want to need a safe and a quick way to apply transformations to a large code base. Um, safe, so it doesn't introduce any new issues. Um, if you make a transformation, you make a change. You don't want to hunt all these new bugs that you caused. Um, quick, in this case, isn't actually about the runtime it takes to apply. This is a much more about the developer time it takes to apply it. If you need to apply this to 2.6 million lines of code, um, something that takes, you know, five times as long could be really, really long time, given you have to do it so many times. Um, and in general, this is sort of a bigger problem that a lot of people have. Many, maybe many of you in the audience have a simil similar problem here, which is refactoring anything at scale is really complicated and requires um, something that is safe and quick. So let's talk a bit about some theory behind what we're trying to do here. Um, automated code transformations have a few ways of working, but the most common way to do it is you have source and you convert into some sort of syntax tree. You do a transformation on the tree. Um, sometimes they're called code mods, code transformations, a whole bunch of different terms out there. Uh, I have looked for a standard definition for what these are called. I could not figure one out, so I called it automated code transformations. Um, you modify the syntax tree, and now you convert the syntax tree back into source code. Um, and the way these often work is you apply a series of fixers to transform, transform the source code. So you have one fixer to do one thing, another one to do another thing. And so you have maybe a dozen or several dozen of these that you apply sequentially. Um, and this is a fairly safe way to automate very tedious tasks. Um, and many of them are, for example, a part of the Python 2 to 3 migration that many of you have or will uh, be experiencing. So there's many applications of automated code transformations out there. Um, one application is uh, style guides, for example, Black is one tool that does that. Yap, I think, is yet another Python formatter, is another one. Um, we primarily use it at Pinterest to port Python code, but we've used it for many other cases as well. It's also useful for the general refactoring. If you're changing an internal interface from moving a module from somewhere in one directory to another directory, that's really, uh, this is a nice way to do it. If you're changing the uh, definition of a function, this is also a nice tool to use as well. Um, automated code, code transformations are really popular in the general development ecosystem. Anybody here use any of these tools before? Okay, good. Um, so Go format's a nice one. This is actually, I think, one of the, the more interesting ones out there. This converts the code to an abstract, abstract syntax tree, and then it walks the tree and prints the code out in a standard uh, format. And one of the things this allowed Go to do is actually to have this tool called Go Fix, which allows them to update uh, code automatically to support new uh, syntaxes and things like that. And one of the main motivations of Go format was actually to support this behavior. So you could have code that could be automatically rewritten um, instead of having to deal with um, handling format or anything like that. And this means that any Go code has always has the same format if you use Go format. Um, another interesting tool, Babel.js. Um, this is used to, same, same pattern here, it converts the code into abstract syntax tree. And in this case, it's often used to convert code into backwards compatible versions to support older versions of JavaScript and things like it. Uh, and C in the C family has Clang format out of LLVM, and it does very similar things as well. 
Um, so how do these all work? How do syntax trees work? And how do uh, code transformations work in general? Um, the most common case I actually still think is regex. Who here has done something like this? Okay, that's a lot more people than I was hoping. Um, I've done this too. This is actually not a real example that we use, but I've used many similar examples. Um, so often regular expressions are really simple. They work really well for really simple cases. Um, and this is sort of like the first thing many people try. So here's a nice simple example we have we're going to use throughout the presentation, which is let's say you want to remove the author tags from code. So here's a simple way to do it. You could do something like said to say remove the author tag. Um, and in this case, um, so we actually, this code will work. It'll remove the line, and everything should hopefully work. Um, but this doesn't actually work for all cases. This isn't very safe. Uh, this is very quick, and it works in the very simple cases. Um, I'm sure many of you, like me, have tried to do a regular expression for a really long, complicated thing. It turns out it causes lots of problems. And so regular expressions are often not really a great long-term solution for transformations. Um, I personally find them really good for one-off transformations where you're making some change very quickly. Maybe it's in one file, it makes it a bit safer. Um, but you often have to manually review all the changes for safeness. Um, some examples this wouldn't have caught this, re this regex here is if your author tag had a bunch of spaces in it, it wouldn't have caught that. Um, if you had a comment after the line, it may actually remove that or it may ignore the line and leave it in, depending on the regular expression. And if your author tag was inside a doc string, it actually would catch it, which may not be technically valid because it isn't an author tag, and you actually maybe should leave it in. Um, although in this case, you may want to remove it, but either way, um, it actually makes the regular expression fairly complicated to deal with. Um, so this is where abstract syntax trees work really well, and so this is, a, this is the model that we're trying to use the rest of the presentation here. Um, so here's a basic piece of code we have. We have a function, and we're returning uh, a plus b. We're summing two values here. So in the top, we have the function definition, and this function is called sum. We have two arguments, a and b, and then we return a binary operator, bin op. Uh, and this is, as opposed to something like a tertiary operator with three values. Uh, and we're at, the operator is add, and we're adding a and b and returning it. Um, so abstract syntax trees, who here has actually learned about these ever? OK, quite a few. Good. Um, so this is sort of a textbook example of, of a syntax tree here from you from uh, computer science classes. And it represents the structure of the source code. And it's abstract since it does not represent every detail of the real syntax. And instead, it contains the structural content-related details. And so a bit of a better example of that is actually here. So this is a bit of a more complex example. Um, so in this case, we have a, we're importing OS, and we have a similar function before. In this case, we have an extra variable total, and we have a comment. So now we have module imports OS. Then we have the function. In this case, it's called sum. It has two arguments, a and b. And here we can see the default values added in. Um, we are assigning two name a plus b, and we have total is what we're returning. Uh, sorry, we're assigning two total a plus b. And note here that the comment comment is not actually stored in the syntax tree. This is because it's abstract, and that information is not really relevant for the abstract syntax tree. Um, and so you can see here, compared to the previous um, example, abstract syntax trees get very complex very quickly. Um, I don't know about you, but this is not more readable than the source code. Uh, but if you're a computer, you would think otherwise. And this is actually much easier for computers to sort of scan over and do things on. And this is why um, compilers and many other things use abstract syntax trees to do analysis instead of using the source code. Um, so let's go to our example of before. We're trying to actually find um, this author tag over here and potentially remove it. So abstract syntax trees are not actually very good for code transformations because they don't have the original information. Um, but they are useful for finding, finding problems and reporting them back. So for example, Flake 8 actually supports doing a linter uh, using an AST, an abstract syntax tree. And so let's see what that actually looks like. Um, so this is actually an example of a, a linter that we actually do use at Pinterest, something very similar to what we use. In this case, we're trying to find the author node. So we have for node in tree body. Um, if it's not an assign operator, for example, we ignore the function def a whole block because so you know that's not related. And then we want to scan all the assign operators here. Um, and if it has, um, you look at all the targets of the sign, and if it's assigning to author, then we return the node, and we actually have found this node here that we're trying to uh, do something with. And so while this is a bit more complicated than the regex, it actually is a bit safer, I think, and it's actually much easier to read. And I think it also makes the more complex cases um, easier to comprehend as well. So we talked a bit about for linting, but let's talk about it for actual code transformation. Syntax trees are often much safer than regular expressions. Um, it's often much easier to handle the edge cases. And um, a big part of this is because you can leverage the syntax trees, such as here, to actually do a lot of the heavy lifting. You know exactly what kind of uh, object it is. You actually have a lot more information about the code you're looking at than actually just trying to look at it uh, by string. 
Um, it's often much easier to do things are multi-line transformations. Say you're trying to refactor the name of an import, but you maybe have a local variable in some, in some files um, where you're not actually importing the, the module you're trying to rename. And so you have to say, is this file, is this module imported? If so, rename it at the import and rename all cases of it. If you do a regular expression, that'll get really complex really quickly. Um, but if you're using a syntax tree, it makes it much easier to do. Um, and even though it's much easier to do a lot of things in abstract syntax trees and concrete syntax trees, um, it often gets really complex quickly and the, the hard cases are always complex. Uh, but I think these, this makes the hard cases possible but complex and the easy cases easier. So this is a direct quote from the, the, um, the concrete syntax tree in Python. Um, so this is a very concrete parse tree. We need to keep every token and every comment and even the comments in white space between tokens. So there's two kinds of syntax trees here. We talked about abstract syntax trees, and now we're talking about concrete syntax trees. Abstract has none of the extra information, doesn't include any white space, any comments, anything like that. But in this case, because uh, Python doesn't have a standard format, we actually need to keep all that information to uh, solve the problem of recreating the original source code. Um, and so we have the second uh, option besides abstract, which is concrete, and this is what we're going to actually be using for everything else, is these concrete syntax trees. Um, this is something that's often not taught, and this is, I think, part because it's a weird edge case wherein we're actually trying to convert code back to the original formatting as much as possible while um, modifying very small uh, pieces of information. So there's actually three different parsers um, in Python to do syntax trees. The two I talk about here, there's another one, which is parser. Um, and this is, it uses Python's internal code to actually do it, internal um, code parser. And this is optimized to generate bytecode and is often too low level for code refactoring. Uh, so we're sort of going to ignore it here. But the other two, uh, AST, which was introduced in Python 2.6, is for abstract syntax trees. As I mentioned before, it's often used in things like Flake 8. And lib2.3, which is interestingly enough also introduced in Python 2.6, is, is a concrete syntax tree. And this was primarily introduced to actually do the Python 2 to 3 transformation. And it does things like, um, it, it's bundled with built-in fixers to do things like changing the accept format from accept x comma t to accept uh, x as t. And as we, showed, we talked a bit about before, this preserves all the relevant information about white space um, and all kinds of formatting information that the AST does not include. Um, so we see here we have an example x equals uh, 1 plus 1, so that should be 2 for x. But the important bit here actually is it's hard to read, but there's actually two spaces in front of that one. Um, and so in the AST, we actually do not preserve that information. But on the, in lib 2 to 3, we actually preserve that information. You see the node on leaf uh, equal, has the equal, so equal operator. We actually could get the suffix. And there we see that it actually has two spaces instead of one. Um, as an interesting side note, I think, related to this conference today, there's actually a lot of interesting work being done uh, by people in the community right now around uh, new syntax tree uh, libraries for Python. Um, the Facebook booth actually has an interesting uh, um, presentation that they're doing about a new um, parser they're building that sort of merges lib2.3 and AST in ways that makes it a bit easier to do. And there's a bunch of work, I think, in Python 3.8 about a new parser m module. And so this is actually a very interesting sort of relevant bit of um, development in this space right now, which I think is very welcoming. Um, so I talked a bit about the tooling. We're going to talk about, um, we talked a bit about the concepts and the theory. Let's talk about some of the tooling here around lib2 to 3. So one option is to use lib2 to 3 directly instead of using any tools built on top of it. Um, there's some gotchas with this. Lib2 to 3 was bundled, as I mentioned before, with the tool 2 to 3. And that's called, and according to the docs in um, Python, that's for automated Python 2 to 3 code translation. And as you mentioned, it's a s concrete syntax tree. It has a fairly com uh, complex interface that actually makes it really sort of funny to do ad hoc one-off uh, transformations and to actually write new fixers and run them if you're not um, shipping your code in any or, or installing your code in any co standard way. Um, it's very powerful and very safe because you use a concrete, concrete syntax tree. If you have any concerns about edge cases, it's very easy to handle. Um, and it has a very useful framework around fixers, and so it actually makes it fairly easy to write these. Um, and it has some nice tooling around it. For example, you could optionally show the change you're about to make, or you could actually apply the change and things like that. So if you write a fixer, you get a lot of things for free. Um, so let's dive into a bit how lib2 to 3 works. So it could be very confusing uh, at first. Um, and it, it often is sort of not what you expect. And the, the syntax tree it produces is a bit complex, um, but it's very, very powerful. Um, there's two types of nodes. There are nodes and leaves. Um, leaf nodes actually contain all the code in this case. And leaf nodes have a type telling you what it contains. There's things like indent, such as indentation increased, string for all strings, including doc strings, a number for any kind of number, integer, float, hexadecimal, octal, et cetera. Uh, right parentheses, left parentheses for parentheses, name for keywords or variables, et cetera. 
Uh, and note here that a lot of these things are actually overloaded for different meanings. So we have name for keywords and variables, or number for string or integers and floats and hexadecimal. And this is, I think, in part because lib 2 to 3 was designed for this co the code transformations and not for actually understanding if something's an octal or hexadecimal. That wasn't really the goal of lib 2 to 3. And so this is a place where if you're trying to do that kind of analysis, it get a bit um, complex and we need a bit more work to sort of understand that. So here is a, uh, I think, the smallest lib2 to 3 transformation I could find in the standard library. So here is a fairly simple one. This is actually changing the format of longs uh, and octal in this case. Both of those have changed under Python 2 to Python 3. Uh, 1L is now 1 because there's no concept of longs. Uh, 0755, uh, that was actually in base 8. That makes it confusing. So you have a different octal format, which would be 00755. Um, so here's a fairly basic example. Let's walk through it. We have this base fixer case, uh, this class which you have to override two methods, match and transform. Uh, match will return either false if you don't care about um, the thing you're looking at, the node you're looking at, or return something that is not false if you want to actually pass it on to transform. And transform takes the node you're trying to transform and the result of match. Um, and so in this case, what match is doing is it's looking if we're starting with a 0 or we're ending with a L of some sort, and then we pass the information into transform, although we don't use it in this case. And then we check the node, and if it ends with the L, we just truncate the L here, because that's all we have to do in that case. But if it starts with a 0 and it uh, passes val is digit, in this case that means that there is no 0 um, O character in the string here, um, and there are no other um, in, uh, uh, values besides 0 in the string, then we actually want to prefix the thing with um, remove the first value and prefix this thing with z uh, 0, O instead. Um, and there's another bit here, which is accept uh, type. And accept type is uh, optimization here, because otherwise match will take every single type um, of thing. It'll take too long to scan. And so in this case, we know we only care about numbers. So here we say we only match numbers. And then we run it through match. And then if it passes, the trans passes match, we actually do the transformation. So here's a bit of a more complex case, but still a fairly basic one here. So this is a second transformation from the standard library. In this case, um, which one is this? This is changing asserts. So a lot of asserts have been deprecated, so this is renaming them. Uh, so in this case, we actually don't have match. We have pattern. Pattern is a, another way we could do it. So uh, when we set pattern in the um, base fix itself, we'll actually compile the pattern and, uh, into a matcher and use it for matching. And it also takes care of accept type as well. So you automatically get both of those for you. Uh, and there is actually a, a tool out there called uh, Find Pattern that allows you to find these patterns. I don't know about you, but I, I don't think I've ever written one of those patterns by hand. Uh, and I don't know anybody, maybe there's people here who can, but I know I can't. And so there's a tool out there that actually goes through code and essentially it's a very basic tool and it prints out the pattern for each line and allows you to sort of introspect it and dig in a bit more and do different things. So this pattern is interesting. Essentially what it's saying is we're looking for a dot and then uh, we have the variable meth, M-E-T-H, and here for method, and we're looking for certain methods. Anything that is the dot after that then matches, and we do this joining of the map here, and we get all the values and names over here. Um, and then in transform, we actually take the result, we look up, um, we get the name there, and then we actually look up in the names dictionary what the new name should be, and we put it inside. And the important thing to note here is we have prefix equals name prefix. This is a, a way of actually taking the prefix and the concrete syntax tree to preserve all the extra formatting and keep it in the new syntax tree so we don't actually uh, lose that data. Um, so the interesting thing here is we actually have the pattern actually is a, a bunch of patterns uh, joined by or. And we actually, this is a fairly common way in lib2 to 3 to apply similar transformations to slightly different things. You could have a dictionary with key values, and you could look up all these different things and map them together. Um, this one is probably not very readable, and that's somewhat intentional. Lib2 to 3 gets very complex very quickly. Um, this is a, a fixer for generator.throw. The format has changed once again from Python 2 to Python 3. And this is actually one of the smaller examples in the standard library. So they actually get very complicated very quickly. Um, and so they could still be very complex to write. So going back to our case before, we're trying to remove the author tag here. So here we have the input author equals Bob. Uh, and this is the fixer we would have here. So in this case, we're using a pattern. So we have a simple statement and an expression statement. We look for author equals anything. Uh, and in this case, note that we have the uh, return character at the end. And what this actually does in the output here, you can see at the bottom, that actually returns, removes the new line. Otherwise, the new line would be uh, included. And the trade-off here is if you remove if you look for the new line here, um, anything after the author tag and a comment or um, anything like that will actually be removed as well. 
Um, this case is actually still fairly naive. Um, we actually, if you have extra spaces in author equals, it actually will not catch that. Um, we could definitely handle that in lib2 to 3, uh, but the transformation will get much more complex here, and I want to keep it simple for, uh, for example. Um, also, this is what I was mentioning before about the runner. Um, you have to do weird things with the path to sort of inject the path, and that's because lib2 to 3 has all these assumptions on how the uh, fixers are named. For example, this is fix author. So if you, you actually um, use lib2 to 3 and you say uh, author, and it'll automatically look up fix author in the module, in this case, named fix author. And so there's a bunch of lib2 to 3 based tools out there, so you don't actually have to write um, sort of stock lib2 to 3 code. Um, the first two are, are fairly similar. Uh, this one's Python future. This is a compatibility layer between to concurrently support Python 2 and Python 3, and it uses Python 3 idioms, and it's based on lib2 to 3, uh, and it has quite a few additional fixers besides the ones lib2 to 3 provides. Uh, lib moder uh, Python modernize is a very similar one. It does a very similar thing. Uh, in this case, it uses 6, and the idea is you actually convert Python 2 code to a subset of Python 2 and 3 that are uh, uh, overlap. And so it actually is a slightly different uh, mechanism, but it uses the same basic concept. It uses, in this case, 6 and lib2 to 3 underneath. And um, in comparison, Futurizes tries to convert Python 2 code into almost standard Python 3 code. And so here is an example. We have a fairly simple example here. We have uh, iter values. In this case, the important thing to know is iter values does not exist under Python 3. And so under Modernize, we actually have six iter values, and we have six string types um, for this is instance over here. But under Futurize, we actually do a bit of a few different things. We have past built in space string, and we do x dot values, which is much more aligned with the Python uh, three uh, syntax. Uh, another tool out there is Bowler. This came from Facebook. Has anybody here heard of Bowler? Okay, a few of you. Um, this is actually my tool of choice currently for writing any kind of uh, code transformation. It requires Python 3.6, but it can be run against Python 2 code. Um, it is lib2 to 3 based, although it uses a slight uh, upstream copy of lib2 to 3 called physics, I believe, F I S S I X. Um, and it makes it a much easier interface, so it's very simple to run things. You just do bowler run and you do the transformation. There's a much cleaner API. You do query, select, modify, execute. Query, you select which files you're looking for. Select which, um, mod uh, which methods and things like that you're actually looking to modify, which piece of code. Modify tells you how to modify it and execute is what to do. Do you want to show the diff? Do you want to save it? Uh, do you want it to be interactive output so you could say yes or no to apply each thing? Um, and this actually makes the really easy cases really easy, but it also, it still reveals all the, the powerful features of lib2 to 3, and oftentimes you have to sort of uh, uh, dig into those and use some of the more complex features of lib2 to 3. So here's a, a fairly simple example of what lib2 to 3 of Bowler supports. So Bowler supports the select statement here. You could actually still use the Python lib2 to 3 pattern um, mechanism, or you could actually do all these different selects. You could say select root, select module, class, subclass, et cetera. And so this is, I think, a much easier interface to use than lib2 to 3 uh, native. So here's that same example we talked about before, but in this case, we're using Bowler. So in this case, if you look at the bottom line, line 11, we have Bowler query the input file. In this case, it's a single file, but also takes a list of files if you choose instead. We're selecting a variable here, in this case, author, and we're going to modify it. And it turns out there is no built-in modifier for remove, so we have a very simple one that looks for the parent node here, and then it just says, if they're a parent, then remove the parent, and that fixes everything. And we see in the output here, we actually remove uh, on line four, remove the author tag, although we do add that extra line over there. Um, and so this is the, the same comparisons I showed you, the same two transformations I showed before. The top one here is the Bowler one, and the bottom one is actually the lib2 to 3 native one. Um, as if you note here, the, lib, the native one actually is smaller. I do think that the Bowler one is actually easier to comprehend and easier to read. I don't know you, about you, but I find the pattern sort of things much harder to read than actually a few lines of code here. And I think it's a much easier interface um, and it, it's been very good for us to sort of see the actual, be able to break it down nicely and be actually be able to use the Bowler interface instead of lib2 to 3 directly. So in addition to these transformations, another really common tool um, that's gotten popular the past number of years is Black. Black is a uncomprising Python code formatter, and once again, it requires Python 3.6, but it runs against Python 2 code as well. Um, it uses lib2 to 3. In this case, it's also a slight fork of lib2 to 3. Um, this is something currently at Pinterest we do not use, but we are looking to use it hopefully in the very near future. Um, and interestingly enough, this validates the concrete syntax tree transformations it makes against the abstract syntax tree. The idea is that if you're making any sort of um, style changes to the code, it should still mean the same thing, which means your abstract syntax trees before and after should still map up. Um, and so this is a good example where we actually could use um, 
a syntax tree to actually transform your code in a very elegant way instead of having Flakegate report to you a bunch of hours and you have to spend 20 minutes fixing it all by hand, doing very silly things like adding new lines and adding spaces. So in conclusion, um, while popular in other ecosystems, uh, code transformations I think are underutilized in the Python community. I think that's really starting to change. Um, I think all of you should be looking into them for any problems you think they could solve. Uh, they often make really hard problems uh, quick and safe. Uh, they've saved us countless hours of tedious labor um, for things like the Python 2 to Python 3 migration, refactoring code in general, um, hopefully soon to be enforcing uh, uh, style guides. Um, and although they're really great, the complex edge cases are unfortunately still very complex. And thank you very much for listening. And I think I have two or three minutes if anybody has any questions. Thank you. So anyone has a question? Hi. Um, I was wondering if there was such a tool that is able to work on Jupyter Notebooks. Would you know? Um, I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I imagine there, it shouldn't be too hard to do, but I do not know of anything. That's a great question, though. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you know of any experiments that have done, been done with optimization on the AST? Yeah, that's a great question. Under Python, I do not know, um, but this is how compilers work in general, and so there is a a rich academic you know, corpus information on how to do this. Roughly the way compilers work is they convert the code into com you know, computer readable code and they do optimizations. Um, I imagine there are optimizations you could do in this, in this way, but you probably could also do it in a different layer, probably inside of Python itself. Um, but I think that'd be probably an interesting uh, space to explore more. Uh, there was a really interesting talk earlier about feature flags. Uh, have you? looked into maybe using this to automatically remove feature flags from code? Yeah, um, that is that is a great question. We have not done that yet, um, although that's a very good idea. I think that's probably something worth exploring. We definitely have had problems in the past where um, you use a feature flag to launch something and you leave it there for three years and uh, maybe cause problems in three years. So I think that's something that's probably, that's actually a really great suggestion. Thank you. Would you recommend using these type of tools if you were trying to undertake the ambitious task of making your code base that your team uses more readable, just from a general readability standpoint? Yeah, I would. Um, I think for a few reasons, it makes, makes the general transformations easier. Um, I think readable is a very subjective thing, and I, I am a big believer in like a standard uh, style guide, and I think that's not because nobody has to agree on what it is. They all could disagree on like what's right, but the important part is it looks the same. Right. And so I think having uh, a standard style guide and something like black to sort of standardize that and make all the work done for you uh, is really nice. Uh, things like lib2 to 3 make refactoring in general really nice. If you have to, you want to, let's say you're moving a, 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 a module from, you know, module A to module B, um, this kind of transformation makes it really easy to do in a general way very quickly. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I would have a question. So you said it can usually get really complicated. So what is the line where you like still done it? Like, Sorry, what is what? Uh, what is the line where you would say it gets way too complicated to work it? Like when you do like a, I don't know comprehension generation for for loops, it's too complicated um, or? I think it, it's the I think the more complicated cases are often the ones that require analysis of an entire module or an entire function to understand something. So often it's the multi-line sort of analysis that you have to do. If you're looking at like the definition of one thing or maybe one line, it's usually not so bad. But if you're trying to solve something, um, here's actually a pretty good example. Um, let me go back. This one's actually surprisingly complex over here. So it turns out actually knowing what is a, um, a, a, a test case so using assert or assert true versus something else that's not inheriting from tests is actually not very easy in this case. So if you look at this transformation, we actually do not make any assumptions or any introspection about where this is coming from. We're making the general assumption here that if you're calling assert equals, it's actually coming from the standard library somehow, which is clearly not always true, but it's true enough in most cases um, that there are edge cases you will hit, and it's really hard to not hit these edge cases, uh, but they're usually small enough that you could catch them by hand. 
Uh, have you ever considered any use cases where you use this for code generation instead of transformation? Um, we have not. I have seen cases where code does use something like two to three to actually do uh, on-the-fly migrations of code to make it two compatible or three compatible. Um, in general, I don't think we have used this for on-the-fly code transformation at, or code generation. So. That was all. Thank you very much. Thank you.